So I'm Craig Teriak, I'm the Vice President of Product Management at Scale Computing. This is going to be an introduction to SC Platform. SC Platform is a really an umbrella term that we use at Scale Computing to accomplish all sorts of things, everything from the SC hardware that we have certified uh, to SC Hypercore, which is the operating system that runs on top of the physical nodes themselves, as well as SC Fleet Manager, which is a management and orchestration engine that's a cloud-based SaaS offering that kind of gives visibility across your entire fleet of Hypercore-based clusters. What we're going to walk through here in today's presentation is a demonstration of the technology. And I, I do welcome questions as we go through to make sure that this is tailored uh, and answering all the right questions. A couple things before I go through this demonstration is what you're going to see here is you're going to see me log into Fleet Manager, which is the web-based kind of cloud-based uh, SaaS offering that provides the orchestration and, and management across the fleet. You're, you're going to see all sorts of different uh, clusters that I have out there. Some are single nodes, some are rack mount servers, some are this three node cluster that I happen to have sitting over here off to the side, which we're calling store 440. So I'm gonna go into that user interface or, and show you some of the power of what Hypercore does itself. And then we'll zoom back out to Fleet Manager. You can see kind of the, where that handoff is between uh, Fleet Manager and Hypercore and how these two combine to a real great solution for edge computing. So here I'm pointing to fleet.scalecomputing.com. I can log in with Google, Microsoft, and local email. Here I'll use Google. And once I'm logged in, this is kind of a dashboard across my entire fleet. So it gives me a, a snapshot of what is the health of my fleet? What are the things that need my attention? One of the things you'll hear us repeat throughout the day here is that the clusters themselves are autonomous. They, they run, they're, they're setting conditions, anything that they can't themselves handle, it will all populate up through all of the various uh, the ways we can get a hold of you. Email, syslog, here in Fleet Manager to let you know, hey, this actually requires human interaction. I'm going to click over to our clusters tab and you'll see I've got it filtered down to our store 440. And if you recall from that intro slide, store 440 is a three node HE150 cluster. It's an Intel NUC based cluster that I have sitting in the office here. Um, within this, you can see that I'm running a handful of virtual machines. Uh, what you couldn't see here is that these nodes are actually, they were uh, pre-provisioned yesterday. I just kind of stood them up using what we call zero touch provisioning. Zero touch provisioning is a new feature that we're launching today. I'll do a separate demonstration just on that right after this. Uh, but what it allows you to do is take a set of nodes, plug them into power, plug them into networking. It reaches out to Fleet Manager where you've got a cluster pre-staged and receives a configuration file. When it pulls down the configuration file, it sets itself up and it's in a state that it's now all the day zero operations that you had to do are done and it's ready for more day one. Let's get the applications on there. Let's get the workloads on there and get that set up. What I, what I didn't show in the demonstration here today, and what you'll see from Dave Dimlo's presentation later, is how to orchestrate a lot of that. If you're doing this at scale, uh, it, it's not often you're gonna be in the user interface to you know, click around and you'll see me creating new virtual machines and that sort of thing. You wanna automate everything you possibly can. And so we ran an Ansible playbook against this, and all of a sudden I've got a handful of workloads that are up and running, already highly available and ready to go. So I click on go to cluster here. Second, there we go. There we are. And you can see I am in store 440. Again, this is a three node system that I stood up with zero touch provisioning yesterday. Each of these nodes at the top represent the RAM footprint that's available for the compute. And these slivers that you see on here are actually the running workloads that I have there. Uh, these were, again, we're all provisioned with Ansible. I can do things such as, uh, actually let me start by saying, when you stand these up, what actually happens is there's a storage layer that we call Scribe. It's the Scale Computing Reliable Independent Block Engine. And in fact, there's a Tech Field Day presentation just on that. If you really want to deep dive on that, I welcome you to do so. It's a really cool piece of technology. But all, it, all it's really doing in, in terms of what we're demonstrating here is pulling together the resources, all of the storage across all three of these so that as I'm going to create new workloads or I'm writing data within these workloads, it's striping and mirroring that data across these failure groups. What that allows us to do is a couple things. Number one is to tolerate things such as a drive failure, such as a node failure. Uh, it also allows me to do things like live migration. If I've got a, a particular workload running on one of these nodes and I want it to run on another node, I can place it there. I can also do things like set affinity and I say, here's exactly where I want all these workloads to run. If you can't run there, you can restart somewhere else, but if that node ever comes back up, you need to move that back. When I'm given this demonstration, there are really three things that, that I try to drive home. Number one is simplicity. It's evident in the user interface, but it's also available in the kind of the API structure we have and the uh, Ansible playbooks that, that we create with the collection that we have as well. 
Uh, I usually will talk about high availability uh, because I think it's so important to recognize that you can't just uh, rely on the applications themselves to always provide availability. They're often legacy applications that rely on the underlying infrastructure to provide that for you. And then the third thing I usually talk about is scalability. To show off the availability of it, I thought it might be fun to actually just pull out one of the nodes within the cluster. And you can see this is one of the nodes, I believe the second node in the system, from our three node cluster. And what you'll start to see happen is there is what we call our management and orchestration engine that powers this entire system that is looking at what the current state is, what the desired state is, and it kind of navigates this path in a safe way to make sure that it's doing everything it possibly can to get it to the desired state, which obviously is all the virtual machines are running and everything's healthy. That AIM management orchestration engine is not smart enough to plug in this node. Obviously, it's going to require physical, you know, hands-on experience. So what it's going to do instead is take, because it has the data striped mirror across this entire cluster, it's going to automatically restart the VMs that were running on that node, which I think it's node two, you'll start to see some of the, the alerts populate here. First one is data redundancy is degraded. That means it doesn't actually have access to both of the blocks that, that it needs uh, to for the, the uh, copy of data that it's placing throughout the cluster. The next thing you'll probably start to see is uh, the network itself. So it can't reach the LAN, can't reach the back plane. And it's, it's uh, kind of going through all the steps to be able to say, yes, this is not just some type of uh, transient error. This actually is a failure of the cluster. I cannot reach this node, therefore I can't rely on it anymore. I need to restart the, the VMs. And so that entire process typically takes a couple minutes for it to, to populate. Meanwhile, as the administrator, I can rest assured that those applications are going to come right back up and I don't necessarily have to be concerned about that. I'm receiving alerts you know, directly from the cluster itself via email. Uh, maybe if I'm using an RMM tool, have that populated into that. Uh, I also, uh, you know, would receive syslog errors that oftentimes you can kind of pull together into a centralized location for, you know, analysis later on. Uh, and then obviously the, the third way, which what we talk about with SE Platform is, you know, how, how does this work when you're looking at, oops, well, at Fleet Manager. And so Fleet Manager is what's going to give you that visibility across not just this one site, because it's not likely you're into the cluster itself, but but really across your entire infrastructure? What are the things across this fleet that actually require my attention? So I, I mentioned the three things, again, simplicity of the product. We, we just showed off the availability of the product where those VMs were able to restart automatically. Scalability, uh, as I mentioned, it really is twofold. Number one is if there are, let's turn this off here. If there are instances where you have additional resources that are required of the infrastructure and your infrastructure isn't able to handle that, you can mix and match not just generations, but node types, drive types, drive sizes, and we can incorporate all the resources you put into the cluster within an, an individual cluster. But scale, again, is, is not just about scaling out the resources of a one specific cluster, it's you know, management at scale. It's, uh, it's horizontal scale across your entire fleet, mixing and matching to the resources of that individual site and what applications it's running. The last thing I'll show you here is um, you know, just one other nice thing built into this. I'd mentioned when you've got your three node system up there, which allows you to protect against failures of, of drives, nodes, NICs, what have you out in the, in the infrastructure itself. Um, but that, that storage layer uh, is actually what allows us to do things like live migrate virtual machines from one host to another, one node to another. And we make use of that for things like rolling updates. And so you can kind of see under the version number here, where I've got an update available, I can kind of click through, read the release notes and apply that update. And what that's going to do is kick off a process where it will start with the first node in the system. It will migrate all the workloads off of that. It'll update everything from the BIOS and the firmware up through the AIM management orchestration engine to the scribe storage layer, everything, the entire stack that we have tested uh, you know, together to make sure that it's all going to work you know, as a unit. And you don't necessarily have to worry about downtime as a result of that planned or unplanned. So. What is the biggest installation that you have uh, today? Biggest installation? It probably is the Ajo Dele's installation. Um, you know, they, they've got 850 sites in Belgium and continually roll out to every one of those sites, uh, typically in three node clusters, um, some with additional ones where they're making use of things like replication and snapshots and some of the more advanced um, uh, data protection suite features that we have. 
eight, eight. Probably storage world as far as capacity. Yeah, that's a good point. So um, off camera, that was Dave Dimlo, uh, VP of product strategy, who was uh, that that other case study that I showed on there. We, you know, when I think about biggest deployment, I'm thinking number of nodes, but Dave pointed out, you know, we think about 14,000 cameras, that's generating a lot of data. And so we've got some giant 2U rack mount servers that have, you know, 20 terabyte drives, several of them all together. A lot of nodes, a lot of clusters. A lot of nodes, a lot of clusters, a lot of data. Uh, that may be the largest capacity deployment that we have. So you mentioned early on that you support a lot of legacy, um, more like what I call cola versus edge deployments. Mm -hmm. um, so what is the percentage of that versus kind of the newer uses of edge with the camera use case would be a great example, I think. Ah, that is a good question. So the last time we surveyed our existing customer base, it was about 20% of our customers were dabbling in containers of some sort. Mm -hmm. Most of them didn't have a container management system at the time. Some were looking at Kubernetes, um, Others, honestly, mo some of that's skewed though, because mind you, if you think about where we came from as a company, we're coming from small and mid-sized customers. They, they didn't have the IT expertise and don't have the IT expertise to deal with the infrastructure itself. They're also not gonna be on the leading edge of adopting containers. Where we're seeing a lot of the growth really is in the distributed enterprise use cases where they've got an application team that may be pushing this, obviously, as a developer, containers are so much easier because they're so portable and there's just a lot of upside to it. And they're the ones that are driving that from what we see in the distributed enterprise. And so there's a lot more adoption there. I, I've also seen customers who may be running containers or even Kubernetes that don't know that they are. I, I was working with a customer that, you know, they were deploying, it was a virtual appliance and it was all prepackaged and I was helping them you know, there's some UEFI stuff, whatever, and look through and it's like, oh, it's doing a cloud in it. Oh, it's running Kubernetes. It's registering up to this cloud control plane. Customers like, yeah, it was a video surveillance edge caching appliance, whatever. And, you know, single node Kubernetes cluster worked the way they clearly developed for, you know, a cloud only or a cloud for public cloud first operation. They needed the cache to be able to run on-prem and, you know, that's the way they deployed it. It was great for the developer. End user didn't know or care. How well does it play in that? Well, I come from a cloud provider background, how well does it play in that space in terms of being able to multi-tenant it, the fleet manager side of things, if we wanted to build a portal that sit on top of fleet manager, I guess? Yeah, if you, if you wanted, in fact, we actually have some MSPs that have done exactly that. Uh, in fact, they're not even doing it on top of fleet manager directly, they're doing it against hypercore clusters. So, um, you know, on that edge computing spectrum, in that regional data center area, which is you know, think of it as like MSPs providing infrastructure as a service or DR as a service, and they have that shared infrastructure. They'll deploy a fairly large cluster or a handful of clusters. And then on top of that, they'll have uh, kind of a tool that basically allows them to parse up the resources and fill out the resources based on whatever the consumption is. Uh, customers that want to go directly into our user interface to do that, you'll see some things in our roadmap that start to move directly toward that. Um, and I don't know how far we want to go into roadmap, but this is just us here. I'm happy to talk about anything we can, which is basically we, we have, within Fleet Manager, you can have a secure link that, that allows you to directly access the HyperCore user interface. And what that does is uh, kind of makes a request of HyperCore. HyperCore then creates an SSH tunnel to use as a proxy without having to have a VPN or anything set up ahead of time. Once that's in place, uh, then we can really start to um, take this to the next level. So the very first thing you'll be able to do is go directly to the cluster. Right behind that, it's directly to the console of the running workload itself. Uh, so with access to the running workload, you can imagine just limiting that to a subset of, you know, these tagged VMs have act are, are available to just this one user and start to, you know, head down the path of multi-tenancy directly within Fleet Manager. The UI is split between the fleet manager and the hypercore management system. Is there, and, and that's because sometimes you want to manage at the edge, at the store? Yeah. Or what is it like, you know, other, other systems I've seen, uh, you know, everything's sort of you know, cloud, you drill in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Trying to understand the reason for that. Well, the, uh, probably the biggest reason is legacy, right? So, so you think about our history where we came from. Yep. Customers were just deploying a single one of these, and they're sitting right next to it as an SMB. Ah, they didn't necessarily need a cloud control plane to be able to manage this. Fleet Manager sits on top of that, and will eventually replace a lot of what you can do within the HyperCore user interface itself. Um, and I think that's probably the direction things are going. I would say one, one of the it's, uh, we're given the demonstration here. I think it's very obvious when you go from Fleet Manager into HyperCore because of the just different look and feel. That's right. At some points, it's, 
as, as we redesign the Hypercore user interface to more reflect the, the look and feel of Fleet Manager, that'll be a fairly seamless handoff. You won't even necessarily know that you're actually on the cluster administering it at that point.